All right, so last presenter of the day is uh, Alan Zinger. He's uh, also a good friend of uh, OSU. He's an alumna, alumnus of the uh, Go Beavs. wood science uh, program at, yeah. at OSU. Uh, he's traveled around the world with the wood products industry, but is back here now in, in Oregon. I'd like to welcome Alan. So I'm going to move this away. So I find myself in the unenviable position of the last presentation of the whole day. It's been a long day, so we'll get a little blood flowing. I just minor audience participation. Raise your hand if you're a manufacturer of something at all. Something. So uh, good reason. Ray, keep keep your hands up. I didn't say to you. Now keep your hand up if you're a manufacturer of a wood product of some sort. So a few lines. Keep your hand up if you are a manufacturer of a panel product or a lumber product. Still a few more. Keep your hand up if you're a manufacturer or you're a sawmiller. How many sawmillers are in the room? So how many have we had? Two, three, four. Well, keep up the good work. We need a lot of lumber. <laughs> These guys need a lot of your lumber. Uh, because without it, we can't make a whole lot of CLT. So uh, again, uh, heard a lot of great presentations today, mostly about the application of mass timber and if issues affecting the application and, and the sustainability of the product. I'd like to share a little bit about the manufacturing side of mass timber and in particular, particular the sawmilling side of mass timber and how it can focus and take advantage of the mass timber market in the future. So here's the graphic, the classic life cycle analysis, the wood fiber analysis of mass timber, you know, from the forest to manufacturing to transportation, design and implementation, even recycling of the product. Uh, it's a great example of all the stakeholders, all the shareholders working together. You know, if there's a breakdown anywhere in this area, if they can't get enough trees from the forest, if the building toads don't quite work, you know, this whole effort. Uh, well, maybe for not, or it becomes a very niche application. I don't believe that'll be the case, but it's important to know that we're all in this together. Um, I will be, like as I mentioned, uh, I will be focusing mostly here on the manufacturing side and the sawmilling side. Uh, there are a lot of great opportunities for mass timber, veneer-based opportunities, uh, the very unique uh, opportunities he presented. Uh, but so my, my presentation forward will be mostly about lumber. Um, as CLT and mass timber increases in acceptance, the demand for lumber will also naturally increase. Obviously, this is great for sawmillers. I spend, my, I'm a salesman. I got a white Ford Taurus. I drive around to exotic places like Longview and Roseburg and K Falls, and I knock on doors and I talk to sawmillers, and they're all interested in CLT, but they have some cautious, uh, with cautious optimism, and they have the same kind of questions. Uh, for a sawmiller, one of the biggest things they're worried about is log supply. Where are the logs going to come from for all this material? Next is where is all the kiln-dried lumber going to come from? Uh, we'll not talk about uh, environmental regulations, but I think we can all agree putting up a smokestack today to make more energy to dry more lumber it's just going to get more difficult. Where are all these sawmills going to come from? Uh, some projections, I heard a projection by 2023, in order to meet mass timber demand, in Oregon alone, there will be five new sawmills. So there will need to be five new sawmills. For a man who sells sawmills, that's a pretty, pretty decent problem to have. But where are they going to be, and where are they going to get all their logs? So I believe that there is a great opportunity uh, for manufacturing lumber for CLT to optimize the performance of a sawmill, the products they cut, how they cut it, how they deliver it, not only to get better yield, better fiber, but to make more money when they focus on the mass timber market. So sawmill, so you've got to look a little bit at the philosophy, and there really is two different philosophies. Uh, sawmilling is a deconstructive process. This is a wire diagram of a log line, very simplistic, but it shows all the cutting tools. Uh, you scan the log, you position the log, 
but no matter what, you're going to create sawdust, you're going to create chips. It's like uh, a, one, a good analogy is like diamond cutting. You're trying to get value and volume and maintain that. But no matter what, you're going to lose fiber in the process. Sawmilling goes hand in hand with the concept of efficiency and the conservation of raw material. The motives are aligned. Where you have CLT. CLT is an additive process, an engineered process. It's not a mistake, they call it engineered wood products. You're assembling a product from different parts. CLT is lumber, labor, glue, and your efficiency is using the right materials in the right way and the most efficient possible, using the least amount of, or the appropriate amount of glue and limiting labor or, or using the right amount of labor. I think there's an opportunity to bridge the both, a sawmill and a CLT plant for benefit of both, for the benefit of both. So where did I go? There we go. So this is a classic cut pattern on a log showing what uh, the concept of recovery. A typical sawmill, you start with a log, you're going to get 50 to 60, it ranges, but you'll get 50 to 60 percent conversion. That means 60 percent of the volume will be, uh, of 100 percent of the log will be lumber. The rest will be sawdust, chips, bark. Uh, there's a lot of different factors that affect that. Log size and quality, uh, the method the, of how you cut your logs, but a very major factor is the products that you choose to cut. If you cut cylinders out of a cylinder, you're going to get 100% recovery. But if you cut a limited set or a limited number of sizes and products, it limits your opportunity for recovery. And then as you get into the CLT manufacturing, there's even more fiber loss. That's unavoidable and natural. Uh, when you take the candidate stock before it becomes lamella, it's surfaced, it's finger, finger jointed. You can have a bunch of smuts on the edge of the finger joint, so you have to surface it again. You have to trim the knots, you lay it up, you gotta trim the panel. So it's an additional 20 to 30% fiber loss in the manufacturing of CLT. So what that gives you is from the tree to the CLT panel, a range of 30 to 40% of the fiber that actually made it into that final CLT panel product. It's reality, it's what it is. I think we could do better. I think there's, there's ways to do it better. Also, in general, as CLT grows, uh, there's, we have the Brock Commons, the bell of the ball here. Uh, there will be different needs for different uh, layups for CLT that demand a different size or a different thickness of panel. I understand that the Brock Commons panel using the floor application was 169 millimeters thick. Divided by five, that's 33.8 millimeters per lamina. Well, when you start with an inch and a half thick board, 38 millimeters, you see it's, it's a 20% loss to get to that lamina size. That's, that's a fiber loss. You know, if you, if you, if you started with a 35 millimeter, a 33 millimeter, maybe an opportunity to save recovery. Also, it's just other sizes might, uh, might be required. It sucks. I, that presentation, you saw many different sizes of lamina. I think that's, that was very interesting and, and an example of needing pr to produce different size lumber for a different product. So there is, Tyler mentioned the standard. It's a new standard. But good news is it's a flexible standard. It is not the, uh, I believe, the range of the thicknesses of lamella allowed is something like 19 to 51 millimeters. It's not rigid, pretty. And then the widths are done on a ratio. So you have a capability of using different sizes. You're not stuck with a standard ALS lumber size. Two by four, two by six, two by eight, four by four. There's also uh, ability to, do, to test and go through new layups. I think you're going through that process right now through the application, through the testing. Um, I've talked to several CLT manufacturers, some of them here today. They have indicated they would like to be able to source a different range of products to manufacture their, their panels, uh, giving them more flexibility. 
So I'm not bagging on the ALS lumber sizes. I don't want to make any lumber sawmiller guys out there. There will always be sawmills that will make commodity lumber, make a lot of, a lot of it make a lot of lumber. But there is always an opportunity to look for a niche to uh, make a natural fit. Uh, plus, I mean, currently, the sawmills are doing really well. The prices are strong. Uh, maybe theoretically a large sawmill probably wouldn't be that interested in cutting an off size at this moment when he can be making all the money he can doing what he does every day. But there's been some good examples in the past where the industry has made specialty products. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones that comes to mind is the Japanese post and beam market. So in the 80s, uh, Japan, the Western industry, the US industry, uh, realized that Japan, which has a very strong wood-framed housing market, they were using a different size lumber. They didn't want to buy two by fours. So a group of mills uh, decided to start cutting metric lumber. You know, Hirokaku, Kudubashira, Hashira, Nadai, Nodai, 105 by 105. We'll do a quiz afterwards in Japanese lumber size. <laughs> and uh, they made a lot of money. It, it's a good market. It's a niche market. But in order to ac access that market, in order to look at that market, you have to sell not only the high grade, but you've got to find a place for your low grade. Everybody can sell it. It's easy to sell high grade lumber. You've got to have markets. So my job, I spent a, a period of my time selling that low grade lumber. Not everybody wants to buy your low grade lumber, unless it's really cheap. <laughs> but uh, truck decking, China would take the low grade lumber. Same, same would go for a sawmill. They would be a little reluctant to cut different sizes of lumber because they don't have a home for that lumber. Well, CLT is the perfect product. You have your high grade lumber on your top and bottom, lamellas on the top and bottom, but it takes a number three. Your low grade can go, can be slipped into the crossband layers if the ratios work out, but it's a product that comes with its own market for high and low grade. So what are some mills doing, or what could mills do? Did it work? So what could mills be doing, mills of the future be doing in various areas to allow flexibility? This video was taken from a new sawmill manufactured by USNR in New Zealand, Red Stag Timber. Heck of a mill. Uh, all brand new, twin quad band lines. So that means they're able to take up to eight four on each side jacket boards off a can. All of them completely independent and flexible in terms of the thickness of the, of the boards that could be produced. Looking at flexibility in your cutting patterns, looking at flexibility in how you sort. Uh, very normal in Europe to, to, to cut random length, to sort and stack random width lumber. Uh, it's, done, it's done a little slight, slightly differently than we do here, but there are opportunities to make more products in more different widths and still handle it in your sawmill. So this gives you a little bit of headache, but this is kind of a cool video to show how a log goes through a mill. Also, kind of show kind of what we do is pretty cool. So uh, modern sawmill equipment, and equi uh, a good equivalent would be a log line. So if you imagine a car running along it, or driving along it, 35 miles an hour, and you could run alongside it, your Hussein Bolt, and you scratch in the paint your name on the side of that car, but you don't hit the metal. You're that accurate, you could just scratch the paint. Those are the tolerances that log lines work at in a much more rigorous environment at much higher speeds. Uh, other areas that uh, Samos could look at, vision grading, machine vision grading. Uh, humans starting to come out of the process of grading but not only grading and looking at the things like knots and cracks and splits, but also including things like moisture, uh, MSR, machine stress rating of lumber, looking at a board and being able to look at a piece of that board and say, oh, this part of the board is too wet. We'll cut that out and save the other piece. It's called cut in two. Or look at a board and see that the density on this part of the wood makes, uh, makes a, uh, an E-rated board for some of the uh, CLT applications. You can cut that out and finger joint it in later.
Lengths. This one actually seems really simple, but it's just one of those ways is the way it's done. In North America, we trim our lumber on two foot increments. It's sold in random lengths, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. We could uh, trim and optimize the board, so we just cut out the wing, made basically random length. If you're making a product for CLT that will be finger jointed anyway, why not make that product? That's an opportunity for an extra foot on every board. Uh, so that's another area, focusing a product for CLT that could help with recovery. Inventory systems. Uh, if you're going to make a particular product in your SAMA that might be different from another, maybe different from ALS, having smart systems, having tally systems that communicate back to the optimizer. And the lumber gets graded, it gets graded out, you know you've completed your order file at the trim sort stack system at the end of the mill. It tells the primers to stop making that product. It reduces making too much or not enough. Um, in addition, some of these systems can talk to the sales, sales floor, the trading floor. As something is sold, it will update the priorities of the optimizer and allow it to make decisions and make products sold five minutes ago. This is a lot of uh, mills are taking advantage of this. Kiln dried lumber, kilns. So there's not enough kilns. In order to feed all these CLT plants, we're going to need a lot of kiln dried lumber. And we're going to need lumber dried to a lower moisture content. So normally in North America, they dry lumber to 19%. They call it transportation or shipping moisture. PRG 90 requires 13% plus and minus two, max 15. So the lumber that is dried for the market is going to be, need to be dried more uh, further. That they're, uh, they're in one, one case, it allows for more downgrade, but in another, it just has to spend more time in the kiln. So what do you got to do? As usual, you got to do more with less. So our southern colleagues learned if you take the doors off a dry kiln, it gets more efficient. Go figure. Uh, it's called a counterflow kiln. You take the doors off, you put the heating in the section in the middle, you send lumber in opposite directions. So what you have is warm, dry lumber in the conditioning zones exiting and being right next to cool, green lumber in the natural uh, entropy, the energy is shifting from the hot dry, hot, dry lumber to the warm, wet lumber. It retains energy. It, it, it ups the efficiency by a, a substantial amount, 20 to 30 percent, uh, which is very substantial. When he, in addition, the extra moisture in those kilns conditions the lumber. You have less degrade having to dry the lumber down to a lower moisture content. I expect you'll see a lot more of these type of kilns come as the need for kiln dried lumber grows. Then uh, the shifting of traditional jobs that are in a planer mill to an ML to a CLT plant. Uh, you might start to see the infeed of a CLT plant look like a planer mill. Uh, this could be helpful for a number of reasons. It would allow the planer mill of more flexible, the CLT plant, more flexibility into source product. They can also trim the product. They could check for moisture. They could kick it out. They could check for strength. Um, they could start to source rough, dry lumber. Not done as much here in North America. Very common in Europe that you produce rough, dry lumber, and then the customer decides what they want to surface it. So exactly how much, uh, how much opportunity is there to optimize uh, sawmill production for CLT? Well, we can quantify it um, through optimization. Optimization have a, has a function uh, called a simulation. So this is a wire diagram, the raw data that comes off of a log scanner. Uh, the optimizer, you can set up a virtual sawmill. You can set up the cutting tools. You can set up all the parameters and then run those virtual logs through the optimizer and get the results. It also allows you to benchmark 
same set of logs, changing parameters, you can tell the difference. So what I did is I ran 10,000 20-foot Douglas fir logs. In one scenario, I had the standard ALS lumber size, 2 by 4, 2 by 6, 2 by 8. The other scenario, I did different widths. And I only added just a half inch to every width. So I did 4 inch, 4 and a half, 5, 5, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. And on the length, all I didn't even do random length. I just said trim it at one foot increments. So the results were pretty startling. And I won't show you all 10,000 slides. But what I will show you is, and as you can see, on the right, on the green, is the CLT opt, or products for CLT. Pretty dramatic increases in the conversion factor. Five, six, seven percent. The bigger the log, the better the increase. And that is, it's a, but you call it, you have more Tetris blocks. You have more tangiograms there to fill up that cylinder. So naturally, you're going to get a better recovery. Well, for sawmilling, recovery is the name of the game. Recovery, or, con or sometimes conversion, means you're getting more lumber out of that same lot, that same wood fiber. Lumber you just weren't making before you made that change. So a 6% increase for a modern, modern sawmill and the modern production list, that's millions of dollars on an annual basis. Now this is a virtual test. There's the realities of logs, there's other values. You know, the trim story stack system for that scenario would have to be a very, there'd be a lot more products, but it's a very good example of kind of what could be done. Um, and it goes hand in hand. I mean, a lot of talk about sustainability, about conserving raw material. Uh, this is an area where it's profitability that meets sustainability and conservation of raw material. It's, they're not mutually exclusive. Rel relatively rarely do we have a win-win. As we drive for better efficiency, less wood is wasted. The positive environmental benefits are increased. So here it is, my last slide. And then we can go drink beer. So this picture was sitting on the wall of our, of, the, of our office. It's from the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. Co-manufacturing, which is a major component, one of the co companies is part of USNR, was participating in the US Pavilion. And they were presenting the miracle product of plywood. And people came from far around to learn about plywood, to learn about how to use it and how it was going to revolutionize the building industry. They'd never seen it before. Uh, and it was great. Uh, you know, does that sound familiar at all? <laughs> so who knows? So in 114 years, will CLT be in widely use, just sort of mundane? Probably. Will they be showing pictures of the Mass Timber Conference in 114? I don't know. But, uh, so very, very tiny, tiny bit of advertisement. So USNR, we make these machines. Uh, 1,200 employees worldwide, manufacturing facilities in US, Canada, Sweden. Uh, we make whole sawmills, we make whole plywood mills, we make CLT plants. Uh, we are excited about mass timber. It is absolutely the number one product generating interest. Uh, really, we've never had something like this. Not only sawmillers are asking us about CLT, but new customers, customers that have never been in the sawmilling industry before are coming to us. So, excited to be here. Thank you for listening to my talk. And if you want to buy a CLT plant from me, come back.